Let me try this again. Here we go. Now we're cooking with gas. No, impressive. Can you see that? Yep. All right, and now we got a couple more folks on. So um, I think you're ready to start whenever you want. And I am going to, on a second, I'm going to stop this for a sec. I'm turning off my video. Hey, Vicky. Hi, sweetheart. Um, just a heads up. I don't think the hyperlink in the email was working. I had to go through the internet to get to here. Don't be cursing at me, okay? Because I don't know what the hell you're even talking about. <laughs> like the emails that go out from the market center. Yeah. Uh, it has links to these uh, Zoom meetings. Right. That link wasn't working. So that's oh. why there's many people on. I'll, uh, I'll let the appropriate person know because um, some other people might have issues too. I'm going to try and screen share this one more time. All right. Everybody see that? Yep. I also dumped it in the chat too, so everybody should be able to grab it from there. All right. So if you could go to page 11, please. Yes. There you go. And we're going to do paragraph 17. <clears throat> All right. There we go. Okay, guys. 17 real estate tax and assessed value. Paragraph 17 is nothing more than a statement. And what it says is in Pennsylvania, tax authorities such as school districts and municipalities and property owners may appeal the assessed value of a property at any time of, of sale or at any time thereafter. A successful appeal by a taxing authority may result in a higher assessed value for the property and an increase in property tax. What that paragraph there is stating is just because you appeal something, because it's your opinion that it's, you're being charged greater than you feel the value is by the assessment, doesn't mean you're right. And they may look at it and say, you know what? <laughs> you should have been 500 more a year. So they're giving you a warning. By the way, if you're going to do this, just note, you may not get a reduction. There may be an increase. Also, periodic countywide property assessments may change the assessed value of the property and result in a change in the property tax. That last sentence is in there for the reason of, if the property is pending, and the municipality and or the city makes an adjustment on the assessment, the taxes could change prior to the property changing hands or going to closing. That change of the assessed value and the increase of the yearly taxes could be enough to throw a buyer out of qualifying for this particular property. So that's why that kind of statement is in there. Now, maintenance and risk loss. Seller will maintain the property, including but not limited to structures, ground, fixtures, appliances, and personal property specifically listed in the agreement in its present condition, normal wear and tear accepted. If any part of the property included in the sale fails before settlement, seller will A, repair or replace the part of the property before settlement, B, provide prompt written notice to the buyer or seller, decision two, credit the buyer at settlement for the fair market value of a failed part of the property as acceptable to a mortgage lender of any, or not repair or replace the failed part of the property and not credit the buyer at settlement for the fair market value of the failed part of the property. If seller does not repair or replace the failed part of the property or agree to credit the buyer for its fair market value, or if the seller fails to notify the buyer of seller's choice, Buyer will notify the seller in writing within five days or before settlement, whichever is 
earlier that the buyer will accept the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of the agreement or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. If buyer fails to respond within the time stated in paragraph 18b3 or fails to terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller within that time, buyer will accept the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement. Seller bears the risk of loss from fire and other casualties until settlement. If the property included in the sale is destroyed and not replaced during the settlement, replaced prior to settlement, buyer will accept the property in its current condition together with the proceeds, if any, as the insurance recovery obtained by the seller or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. So let's go back to the top of paragraph 18. The seller is responsible for the mechanics of the home up to and including the settlement date. So if you're doing your walkthrough and the refrigerator was included and you open the refrigerator and it's hot, hmm, and it's plugged in and the circuit isn't tripped. So you're like, uh-oh, that's not working. Or you go to turn the dishwasher on and it doesn't turn on. Something's radically wrong here, right? You go to turn on the heat and the heat doesn't kick on. See, all of these things, when you're doing your walkthrough, you have to check to make sure they are in working order. Now this becomes a bit of a struggle because it's two hours, it's an hour before closing and some appliance or such is deficient. It says in here a few times that um, the fair market value of the failed part. That's a challenge. What is the fair market value of an 11 year old dishwasher? Well, that's the question, right? Dishwasher's not working. You get to the table, you're like, Mr. Seller, we did our walkthrough and the dishwasher is not working. How do we handle this? How do we determine what a fair market value? is for an 11 year old dishwasher. Now you're at the settlement table. How are you gonna determine how much we need as a compensation? See, we have to think out in the box, right? And we have to think quick, we're at the table. How do we do that? Oh my God, uh, other than calling Vicki, She's under anesthesia on some OR table, so you can't get her. So how are we doing this? Okay, so there's a couple schools of thought. You can call a secondhand appliance store and get an idea, an approximate of what the value of a particular item may be. You could call a repair guy, an appliance repair, repair company, and try to get a general idea of what the value of an 11 year old dishwasher is, it's always a challenge, believe me when I tell you. So you're gonna be floundering without a doubt. Do not hesitate to call somebody and say, listen, I'm in a pickle here. The refrigerator and refrigerators are much more expensive than a dishwasher. So that becomes an issue on determining what is replaceable? Is it a $250 part or, you know, we have to kiss it to God because it's really dead. So that's always a challenge. It really is. Okay. So that's why your pre-settlement walkthroughs have such value. That's why you as the buyer agent have to make sure you're doing your due diligence and making sure these appliances are in working order. Okay. All right, home warranty. At or before settlement, either party may purchase a home warranty for the property from a third party vendor. Buyer and seller understands that a home warranty for the property does not alter any disclosure requirements of a seller. 
will not cover or warrant any pre-existing defect of the property and will not alter, waive, or extend any provisions of this agreement regarding inspections or certifications that buyer have elected or waived as part of the agreement. Buyer and seller understand that the broker who recommends a home warranty may have a business relationship with a home warranty company that provides a financial benefit to the broker. Paragraph 20, recording. This agreement will not be recorded in the Office of Recorder of Deeds or in any other office or place of public record. If buyer causes or permits this agreement to be recorded, seller may elect to treat such act as a default of this agreement. Now, when you read that quickly, you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, recorder of deeds, the deed has to be recorded. What are you talking about? I'm all confused here. You're confused because it says this agreement will not be recorded. They're speaking of the actual agreement of sale, not the deed itself. They're speaking of the agreement of sale will not be recorded in the office of the recorder of deeds. You cannot record the agreement of sale. That's what that statement is. Assignment. This agreement is binding upon the parties, their heirs, personal representatives, guardians and assessors, and to the extent assignable on the assigns of the party here too. Buyer will not transfer or assign this agreement without the written consent of the seller, unless otherwise stated in the agreement. Assignment of this agreement may result in additional transfer tax. You may see an agreement of sale that says, the buyer is Vicki Carey, and or assignees, meaning that she may, which is legal, find another buyer to purchase the property before Vicki actually purchases the property. So it's a purchase and transfer immediately. It is legal to do such a thing. 22, governing laws, venues, and personal jurisdictions. The validity and construction of this agreement and the rights and duties of the parties will be governed in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The parties agree that any dispute, controversy, or claim arising under or in connection with this agreement or its performance by either party submitted to a court shall be filed exclusively by and in the state or federal court sitting in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Everything falls in a chain of command. So the government, the governing laws and jurisdictions would start the city of Philadelphia, the county of Philadelphia, the state of Pennsylvania, and then in the federal parts of the law. So everything falls in a chain of command. If you're in the burbs, you're gonna have the municipality of Bucks County, Montgomery County, et cetera, then the state of Pennsylvania, then any federal laws, okay? So we have a chain of command when there are disputes that need to be addressed. Paragraph 23, Foreign Investments in Real Property Tax Act. This paragraph deals with taxes that have to be paid to the IRS. It speaks about foreign tax person or a person who is not a citizen of the United States. There's a variety of rules and paperwork. So if you're dealing with a purchase and you represent an individual who is not a citizen, there are additional investment and tax acts that have to be addressed, just to let you know. Notice regarding convicted sex offenders, known as Megan's Law, the Pennsylvania General Assembly has passed legislation, often referred to as Megan's Law, providing for community notification of the presence of certain convicted sex offenders. Buyers are encouraged to contact the Municipal Police Department or the Pennsylvania State Police 
for information related to the presence of sex offenders near a particular property or to check the information on the Pennsylvania State Police website. All right, let's do a scenario. You're working with a single mom looking for a property. She has two little girls and you're out looking at three properties. And the mother says to you, you know, I was telling my coworker that I was looking at these three properties tonight. And my coworker said that the second one is in the same community that she lives in. And she said that there's a sex offender in the community. How do you handle that? Where do you go with that statement? How do you address that? She says to you, is there, is there a sex offender? Or I have two little girls, I'm a single mom. I, I mean, I, I, you, you represent me, what are you gonna do for me? How do we respond to that statement? Come on guys, let's think about it. You're standing on the sidewalk and we need to know, we need to know how to handle that. All right, thanks, thanks for knocking. Okay, nobody knows. All right, so you refer them to Megan's Law. You refer them to the municipality. You refer them to what states here, the Pennsylvania State Police. You stay far, far away from that question. It's not your responsibility. It's not your obligation to determine if the, quote, sex offender is even in the community. You guide them to use what's available to them from the state, okay? All right. <clears throat> um, hang on a second. All right, here we go. Um, representation. All representation, claims, advertising, Promotional activities, brochures, or plans of any kind made by the seller, broker, their licensees and employees, officer or partner are not, <coughs> excuse me, a part of this agreement unless expressly incorporated or stated in this agreement. This agreement contains the whole agreement between the seller and buyer, and there are no other terms, obligations, covenants, representation, statements, or conditions, oral or otherwise, of any kind whatsoever concerning the sale. This agreement will not be altered, amended, changed, or modified except in writing, executed by the parties. So whenever there is a change to the agreement, let's say we are just starting this contract. You've sent it over, you represent the buyer, it's gone over to the listing agent. Listing agent sent it over to the seller and the seller is pretty much okay with it except for two things. One, you didn't come in full price and they want full price and they need an extra 15 days to close. So those two counter offers were changed by ink or were cross struck out, altered on a computer such as dot loop or DocuSign, and then had to be initialed. Anytime anything is altered from the original contract has to be initialed, dated, okay? You just can't randomly do this. Be careful. We are actually in attorney engagement for a situation where multiple offers came in and the seller signed one offer two hours before the second offer. Unfortunately, it was a hot mess. We had to go to DocuSign and have them pull the times noted on the initials, electronic initials from the seller to determine which of the two buyers contracts were signed first. And 
And not only that, but there was one of these offers who had strikeouts and initials and then not stricken out and not initialed. So when things become more than one time altered, stop being lazy realtors. Redo those pages that are needed. It gets too convoluted. There are agents, which I think is fabulous personally, when there is any change to the agreement, the seller comes back with the two counters. I need full price and I need 15 days more for closing. It could be verbally agreed. The buyer agent will alter page two because both of those terms are on page two with what was verbally agreed, resend it to the buyer, have them initial the bottom because now it's a clean page. Have it sent to the seller, the seller initials off. There's no misunderstanding, there's no striking, there's no initialing, there's no dating. This is where problems happen. And unfortunately the agent was new, wasn't schooled enough to understand what he was doing. And now we have attorneys involved in this hot mess. So let's keep it as clean as possible. It's an easy correction but people are lazy. They don't want to type out page two again. Stop being lazy. If I've said it once, I've said it 15 times. Okay. Nikki, I'm sorry. So just to clarify, only extract page two and only redo page two. Correct. Okay. Because the rest of the contract is acceptable. Okay. Correct. Can I so let's that? Just, what is it? What if it's a different date? So if you have page two and say it was signed two days ago, they countered and now it's like the seventh. When they sign just to update the page, it's dated the seventh. Okay. So if it's the seventh, what is the last change to the agreement of sale? The seventh. Uh, so yeah, you I guess. actually have to go through the whole, be careful of looking at the contract because there might be a page that has the, a date that's later. So if it's page two that you're changing, right? So remember the seller didn't sign it. This is a counter. Wow. Oh, true. Right? Yeah. So page two is being, is being altered. So you've corrected it by putting a clean agreement together of page two. They will initial that page and now the seller is going to take the whole new package and then on page 14 sign with that date, right? Because if the seller had signed it, well, now we've got a conflict. Then if the seller did sign page 14, then page two would have to be initialed and dated, not just initialed because it's a different date. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So yeah. dating is huge to know who's on first, what's on second. Okay. All right. Um, okay. 25B. Unless otherwise, otherwise stated in this agreement, buyer has inspected the property. Now I'm going to tell you something funny. <clears throat> Not that I'm all that in a bag of chips. But I got to tell you, I do this so much. I know of these little tricky sentences. In the beginning of COVID, when buyers were purchasing sight unseen, and we hurried up and threw some sort of an agreement together uh, between PAR and, and brokers were putting things together that the buyer was purchasing it sight unseen. I happened to be talking to a manager from a Berkshire Hathaway office about something, I don't know. And she was saying to me about, she was from the suburbs and she was mentioning about her agents having transactions with sight unseen. And I said to her, well, are you having your buyer's agents strike those five words? And she said, what five words? I said, on paragraph 25, buyer has inspected the property. She said, oh my God, I didn't even know that was in there. So 
these things are really important because in that situation, I bet there were very few agents who knew enough to know that that five, that those five words were in there. Those five words should have been stricken. And in a, and these forms needed to play off of those five words because it's a statement in the agreement. Buyer has inspected the property, including the fixtures and any personal property specifically listed herein before signing the agreement or has waived the right to do so and agrees to purchase the property in as is condition. The property is always in as is condition. All buyers are purchasing the property in as is condition. How many times have I seen on paragraph 32 on page 14, the added in verbiage, buyer is purchasing property in as is condition. In its present condition is always how a buyer is purchasing the property. That is why buyers have an option for a due diligence. You're buying it as is, but go ahead, check it out and decide if you can live with what you find. It's always in there. Subject to inspection contingencies elected in this agreement, buyer acknowledges that broker, their licensees, employees, officers, and partners have not made an independent examination or determined the condition existing in the locales where the property is situated, nor have they made a mechanical inspection of any of the systems contained herein. That part of that paragraph is saying, no one is taking responsibility, especially the agent, of looking it over and coming back to the buyer and go, yeah, it's in pretty good shape. I looked it over, the heater worked, the air kicked on, the water heater's working. No, 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 no. That is over your pay grade. That is not your responsibility. Any repairs required by this agreement will be, cle will be completed in a workmanlike manner. <clears throat> Excuse me, paragraph C is about as loosey goosey as it gets. Remember, if you're in a situation on a reply to home inspection and there is no more money that can be given to your buyer as a conclusion to the reply to home inspection, there is no money that can be given from a seller to the buyer due to the fact you have maxed out on your seller's assist. Please, please, knowing that going in, you need corrections. You will then add who the vendor is going to be to make those repairs. Relying on the seller, it's going to be a hot mess who they're going to get to make these repairs. If it's a rehabbed property, the GC is going to have their people do it. They're not going to hire a separate electrician, a separate plumber. It's not going to happen. So on re have to properties, you're kind of mandated to go and stuck with the GC's guys. But if this is a private property being sold by an individual or individuals, and there is no monetary acceptable, according to the mortgage lender, way to get any money so that the buyer can make these repairs, make sure you indicate who's going to make those repairs. Electrical. There's always electrical. I don't care if it's new construction. There's always something squirrely with electric. It's just how it is. And in that reply, you're going to say all electrical deficiencies will be repaired and corrected by Jack Flash Electric. Boom. Now you know the quality. You've worked with Jack Flash. You know that he's going to be up front, do a good job, licensed and insured. Now you have confidence for your buyer that the work's going to be done correctly. How many phone calls do I get? How many emails do I get? Oh my God. We walk through three days, seven days, one day before closing to find out what a hot mess on these repairs. 
They took their reply to inspection addendum with them and nothing's right, everything's wrong. Yeah, that's because the sellers will be sellers. So protect your buyers to the best of your ability by including whom is going to make those repairs. And that is a requirement to the seller. We're asking to have this repaired and this is to whom we want to have the job done by, okay? It goes so much smoother when you can get it done that way, all right? Okie dokie. Um, broker have provided or may provide services to assist unrepresented parties in complying with the agreement. What does paragraph 25D mean? Broker have provided or may provide services to assist unrepresented parties in completing in complying with this agreement. Who would be an unrepresented party? Let's think, let's go all the way back to page one. A buyer without a, who's not represented by a realtor. Okay. Who else on the sell side? Or sell by owner. Of course. There you go. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, remember the for sale by owner got this brilliant idea to list his house up on a Wednesday at 2.30 in the morning watching something on TV. You know, something that goes along with, you don't have to pay all that cost to a realtor. You can do this yourself. Now, they realize, oops, this is a little harder than I thought. Now they have to have something done. Like maybe there's a violation on the property. They don't even know they need a UNO. When you're dealing with a for sale by owner, strongly recommend that either a title company and or um, a conveyancing company such as we have in house, right? Um, with, we changed the name, what's it called? Go to closing with Lauren. She does it. Take me to closing. Thank you. Take me to closing. For $195, Lauren can fix all these seller problems that they don't even know exist. You say to them, where's the UNO? What? What's a UNO? I don't even know. Get that right in the very beginning. Plant that seed. Listen, Mr. Fisbo, you have responsibilities. You have a mortgage payoff. You have a UNO. And if there's any judgments, liens, and encumbrances against this, this is on you. Usually you can scare them with those big words, liens, encumbrances, big words. For $195, you can hire this person who will be able to get all this for you. So... Very important that you realize, even though you don't represent that for FISBO, you can guide them, okay? Paragraph 26, default termination and return of deposit monies. This paragraph eats my liver every day. And it says, where buyer terminates this agreement pursuant to any rights granted by this agreement, buyer will be entitled to a return of all deposit monies paid on account of purchase price pursuant to the terms of paragraph 26B and this agreement will be void. Termination of this agreement occurs for other reasons, giving rise to claim by buyer and or seller for the deposit monies. Regardless of the apparent entitlement of deposit monies, Pennsylvania law does not allow a broker holding deposit monies to determine who is entitled to the to deposit monies when settlement does not occur. Broker can only release the deposit monies if this agreement is terminated prior to settlement and there is no dispute over entitlement of deposit monies. A written 
agreement signed by both parties is evident. There is no dispute over deposit monies. Hang on guys, let me silence this. If after broker has received deposit monies, brokers receive a written agreement that is signed by the buyer and the seller, directing the broker how to distribute some or all of the deposit monies, or according to the terms of a final court order, or according to the terms of a prior written agreement between buyer and seller that directs the broker how to distribute deposit monies if there is a dispute between the parties that is not resolved. Now, removing money from escrow accounts are extremely rigid in Pennsylvania. Essentially, there's like five ways to do it two of which often deal with new construction and or predetermined terms agreed upon with the execution of the agreement of sale. But generally, there are three ways money leaves an escrow account under normal circumstances in dealing with a resale property. The first one is the escrow account is noted that we are going to closing and that that money has to leave the escrow account and go to the title company because we're going to close on Friday, 123 Main Street. Okay. So the listing agent goes to their escrow department, pull out the $5,000 for 123 Main Street, and it goes to go abstract because we're closing on Friday. Okay, cool. The escrow department from whomever's holding the money will pull it out and send it to the title company. Number two, mutual acceptable written agreement by all parties. Does anybody know what that means? What does that mean? A mutual acceptable written agreement by all parties. Okay. Can I take so a go ahead. I was, I was joining uh, because I, uh, I haven't been a, in one of these refreshers in a while, but you know, I called you, I think a couple of months ago about a uh, distribution of deposits. So this is, this is my, I, I hit the jackpot today, Vicki. This is my Christmas present that you're covering this today. <laughs> but uh, there is a form. I know there's a couple of forms out there that some require uh, one party signature, the one that distributes the funds require both party signatures. That exactly. has to be the one that's used. Termination and return of deposit money form. That form is two parts. The first part is the termination. Whoever's terminating the contract, buyer and or seller. The second part talks about the deposit monies and how they're going to be distributed. To whom is getting the monies? So let's pretend. Let's pretend, God forbid, um, a buyer loses their job, which is a horrible thing. Um, buyer was supposed to be transferred and the transfer was terminated. And they have evidence to prove that the transfer was terminated, they've lost their job, whatever, the, God forbid, the situation is. And they clearly cannot get a mortgage because they're not moving or they've lost their job or whatever the circumstances may be. Um, and the seller's like, Jesus, that's a shame. He reads the letter from Wells Fargo and he sees the guy's not getting transferred to Cincinnati and it comes from the corporate headquarters. And he's like, listen, the guy's not going to Cincinnati. Like it's a problem, but you know, there's nothing we can do. So everybody's in agreement. This buyer should get his 5,000 back. It's not his fault. He's not being transferred. God forbid he lost his job. God forbid he was promised 10,000 from Aunt Lucy as a gift. And now she backtracks and says, nah, change my mind. I'm not giving you that 10,000. There's all kinds of scenarios that can happen. But if everybody's in agreement that it wasn't the buyer's fault or the buyer had no control of this, 
And so, yep, they should get their money back. Then everybody's going to sign off that that 5,000 does go back to the buyer. That is a mutual acceptable written agreement. Both sides have determined how the money is to be distributed and agrees to those terms. Those terms are what I'm always looking for because I have to approve this before money comes out of escrow. And it makes life wonderful. Let's pretend somebody gets a B in their bonnet. Let's pretend the seller says, I don't care. I'm not giving your money back. I don't care the transfer didn't come through. I don't care you lost your job. Well, you know, the seller's being quite unrealistic and will not agree to the 5,000 going back. Now, about five months ago, I had a very long discussion with both Jay Baraf and with Hank, who is the head attorney of PAR. And we went into great detail and we're gonna go over that partly in this paragraph. But the responsibility of the listing agent when there is a dispute, and this is where realtors drop the ball. If you represent a seller and the seller is in dispute of the buyer getting their money back, the day after closing, that did not happen. If we were supposed to close on the 16th of December and today is the 17th and we did not close and the buyer is mad, and he's like, these people are not getting their money back. That, that seller has to be proactive immediately. The problem is sellers are not proactive immediately and they want to sit on this. No, no, no. Sellers have to immediately file for dispute resolution with the board you are a member of. If you are a member of Suburban West, then you have to file with Suburban West. If you are a member with PAR, Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtor, that seller has to immediately file a dispute resolution because in the contract, I am bound to return the deposit money unless I know of a dispute. Now, in this very heavy discussion with PAR, that states that I have to return the deposit money with X amount of days, and we'll go over that. My argument to par was this. If I'm the listing agent and I'm holding the deposit monies as indicated according to the agreement of sale on page two, is it not my fiduciary responsibility to notify my seller who is my um responsibility that the buyer is re requesting their monies back. And we went around and around and finally Parr said, you know, I see where you're coming from. They're my client. I have a fiduciary responsibility to let them know, even though they did not move forward and file a dispute resolution that proves to me there is a dispute. I need to tell them their buyer is, the buyer is looking for that money. So it's a fine line there. Agents need to know if there is a dispute, immediately the seller has to go to the board and file a dispute resolution. Immediately, no fooling around here. Immediately, immediately, you get a hold of your seller and say, listen, dude, here's the phone number to GPAR. You want to speak to Cheryl. You need to file a dispute resolution. If you are angry and in not in agreement of returning this deposit money, you have to take action. The problem is these sellers are not taking action because they're not told they have to take action. Okay? So I'm strongly emphasizing that. You must get your sellers to show action. It says here that in paragraph 26C, Buyer and seller agree that if there is a dispute over the entitlement of deposit monies that is unresolved, blank days, 180. 180 is how long? Six months. Hello? How long is 180 days? 
Okay, I'll help you. That's six months. Okay. If not specified when after the settlement date stated in paragraph 4A or any written extension thereof or following termination of the agreement, whichever is earlier. Wow, that's a long time. That's six months after the settlement date before anybody can come to a meeting of the minds here. Whichever is earlier, then the broker holding the deposit monies will within 30 days of receipt of buyer's written request, distribute the deposit monies to the buyer unless the broker is in receipt of verifiable written notice that a dispute of the subject litigation or mediation. So in that blank line on page, excuse me, on line 696 is not altered 180 days after the settlement date. So we're supposed to settle on December the 10th and we do. Now we got to wait 180 days, December 10th, January 10th, February, March, April, May, June, June 10th. We have to wait six months before we can even start zigzagging about this. Most people change that date to 30 to 60 days. I would not recommend under 30 days, to be honest. It takes time to get all of this squared away. 30 to 60 days after the settlement date on the agreement and or any extensions thereof. Within 30 days of receipt of buyer's request. Nope. So that has to come to me. I no, get a no, request no. from the buyer that they want to terminate and get their money back. Yeah, or really it's, it's a letter that says, um, buyer wants to get their money back. I have to then notify my client. My client is the seller. Hey, listen, the buyer sent me a letter. They want their deposit monies back. What are you going to do? That's where that fine line came in when we were going back and forth with PAR that I feel it is my responsibility to notify my client, the seller, that the buyer is requesting their monies back. If broker has received verifiable written notice of litigations prior to the receipt of the buyer requesting for distribution, broker will continue to hold the deposit monies until receipt of a written distribution agreement between buyer and seller or a final court order so I'm going to be hanging on to that money until I get a mutual acceptable written agreement signed by all parties, or I get a final court order. Buyer and seller are advised to initiate litigation for any portion of the deposit monies prior to any distribution made by broker pursuant to this paragraph. Buyer and seller agrees that the distribution of deposit monies based upon the passage of time does not legally determine entitlement of the deposit monies and the parties maintain their legal right to pursue litigation even after the distribution is made. Now, that last part of the sentence you gotta think about. What that is saying is, if I am obligated to return the deposit monies because the seller did not move forward and obtain any type of dispute resolution or legal action to hold the deposit monies, it says, and the parties maintain their legal right to pursue litigation even after the distribution is made. So if I am legally bound to return the $5,000 to the buyer, it says that the seller can still pursue and get that 5,000, even though it was given to the buyer. Hmm, think about that for a minute. Do you think that 5,000 is ever going to exist again? That the buyer is going to be able to say, okay, I lost, I'll return the 5,000? That 5,000 is long, 
long gone. You're going to spend more money in litigation trying to get that 5000 that they say they spent on a brand new car and decided not to buy a house. And then their judgment's going to have to be filed against the buyer. I can't begin to tell you the heartache this is. The time and energy it takes to get this right. Be very, very careful with your sellers. Make sure they file and show action that they are not wanting to return those deposit monies. Okay? I can't tell you how many times this has to go to litigation. It's unbelievable. So be careful with your deposits. Yes. Nikki, I, like, at what, at who determines, and I'm suspecting like GPAR and they have a committee, but I mean, if somebody loses their job, well, you, my termination, we just terminated because the association is in litigation. So, you know, thank God they're not giving us a problem. Right. But on what grounds before, right after we got the 30, for a seven, the next day we terminated. Mm -hmm. But what grounds would a seller have to say, no, I'm not going to return the $20,000? Like, well, they don't have to have grounds. They just have to be cranky bastards. So they're, so the sellers would have to file that. And like, say our closing day was originally the 28th, which it was. So by the 29th, that seller should do the dispute. Correct. File a dispute resolution. So they Correct. could do it up until the day after uh, what originally would have been the settlement date. Or any extension thereof. Or any extension. That's why I'm getting confused. Okay. So let's say on the agreement of sale, you were going to close on the 28th. Yes. But during this whole process, you had filled out an addendum, change of terms, and you guys moved it to January 16th. Now, January 16th is the date you were supposed to close. Got it. Okay. Right. That's what they mean by, so if there was any yes. changes. Got yes. it. Okay. I mean, thank God we're not in that situation. But thank I just God. figured, yeah, I just was one curious as to see like something as legitimate as this. Why would they fight us? Because people will be people. Got it. Right. And we can't figure out people. My God, they're crazy. So it's really important for the seller to show action if they are going to request to obtain the deposit monies rather than returning them. Okay. So it's really important. So Vicki, if I may, so 26C, so if the seller has not filed anything to keep the deposit within six months, the within six months after the closing date, the buyer can write a letter to you right. asking for the return. Correct. You notify the seller saying, hey, Mr. Seller, the buyer wants his deposit back. Can the seller, even though the six months has passed, say, oh, no, oh, no, Vicky, I want to file now. And they do. They do it all the time. Therefore, it's this really onion skin kind of ooh, grace part of this paragraph. Many sellers, once they're made aware that the buyer is requesting their money, I'll get a phone call because I have to send out a letter to the seller. Mr. Seller, in regarding to the transaction of 123 Main Street, the buyer is now requesting their deposit monies back. I'll get a phone call three days later. Don't you dare. Even though the six months has passed? Yes. I have 30 days to return the monies. And so I have to notify my client, the seller, that the buyer is asking. I get a phone call, don't you dare. Don't you dare release that money. I go, Mr. Seller, unless I get something from an attorney, I'm bound. Next thing I know, I get an email, I get a certified letter from an attorney representing now the seller. No, no, no. This is going to a dispute. So it's really not 60 days, because I thought once because the, the seller had 60 days. So now I guess, where does the extra time come in for them to file? Because now it's become a litigation and I bounce right off of that. I'm like Teflon. <laughs> now that you people are going with attorneys, Vicky takes the back seat. You guys scream and holler and carry on. I don't, I back right out. Technically it's supposed to be returned. A 
That's what Parr saying. Mm-hmm. Or yeah, Parr. And I'm like, yeah, but wait a minute. Just because the seller didn't do what they really should have done because agents don't know enough to tell them, that's a deficiency on the listing agent's part, number one. And number two, now that I'm, they're my client, I represent the seller. My seller has to be notified that the buyer's requesting that money. That's when all of a sudden the wheels start to turn. It's a very fine line. And that, you know, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty kind of a thing. So even after the six months, so once you notify the seller to return deposit, if, what if the seller doesn't reply back or what, do you give them a certain time frame? I have 30 days. If I do not hear any response from the seller, the money is returned to the buyer. So within basically that 30 days, if they say, Vicky, you know, I need another 60 days, but I'm going to file litigation. Is it still, okay, Mr. Seller, you've had the six months plus the 30 days, where, where were you? Or do you still give them whatever time frame they, they ask for? No, if the seller comes back and says, don't you dare, you better have an attorney call me tomorrow. Okay. Because unless I get proof of legal action moving forward, I have to return that money. Got it. Yep. So it's a really fine line. And we kind of went around and around and around. And finally they were like, well, I do understand your position here because that is your client and you are giving notification. See, this paragraph has some perhaps controversial statements, some weak statements, and it's purposely done that way. It's purposely done that way. So that is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? So whenever attorneys now get involved, Vicky backs out immediately. You guys fight it out. I'm out of here. That's why. They but as them. agents representing sellers, you need to know the moment this thing is a default, that seller has to move forward and show action if they that's really want to keep this money. Okay. Yes. That's it. That's a big agree that they don't want the buyer to get the money back. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Correct. 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 D. Buyer and seller agree that the broker who holds or distributes deposit monies pursuant to the term of paragraph 26 or Pennsylvania law will not be liable. Buyer and seller agree that if the broker or affiliate licensee is named in litigation regarding deposit monies, (laughs) the attorney's fees and cost of the broker and licensee will be paid by the party naming them in litigation. Seller has an option to retain all sums paid by the buyer, including deposit money should the buyer fail to make an additional payment as specified in paragraph two, which I also find very interesting. If there is a second deposit due, and we're realizing early because we did our home inspection very quickly that this property is a hot mess and we're really thinking about getting out of it, the buyer, they make a decision, oh, I don't want to give the second deposit. Mm -mm -mm. You don't have that option. You've agreed to and signed off and initialed in the agreement of sale. Within X days, you are going to bring in another 10,000. It doesn't say that you satisfy all of your terms. It's a blanket statement. You will turn in that money. If you don't turn in that money, now the buyer's in default. Now the seller says, wait a minute. If they want it out of the contract, that's one thing, but they defaulted on their second deposit. Now the buyer's wrong. Be careful with deposit monies. I can't stress it enough. I deal with this all the time. When we talked about in the first class, deposit monies, and how I personally am so rigid and try to be so rigid in giving deposit monies. This is why I personally like to give deposits after we've all agreed to the terms of the inspection. I don't always win in trying that technique, but I win a lot. I win like 85% of the time and I'll make one deposit after we've all agreed to the terms. That doesn't always fit in every transaction. 
And I have agents say to me, yeah, but Vic, but Vic, but Vic, what if, you know, there's seven offers and, and I have to be stronger? Well then, okay, then don't do that. But note, you've increasing your risk to your buyer and getting the deposit monies back. There's pros and cons to everything. You have to weigh it out. You have to explain to your buyer by not doing this, oh yeah, we're gonna give you deposit, but we're gonna give it to you after we've all come to terms with the home inspection. If you want a stronger agreement, well, sure. That's not gonna give you a, a stronger place in the pecking order since there's multiple offers, but there is a risk and here is your risk. Make sure your buyers understand the increase of risk by putting more deposit monies down. I'm telling you guys, paragraph 26 is a hot wicket. Be careful with that. So Maybe. if, Maybe. go On ahead. The deposits, what do you suggest would be the percentage of a second depo a deposit? In an FHA transaction, FHA is only three and a half percent down from Jump Street. Right. So I personally, in an FHA transaction, I'm going to give the seller the three and a half percent. I mean, right. it's next to nothing anyway, right? Uh -huh. I try in a conventional not to give more than 5%. Okay. I was, yeah, I was like pretty much guided five to 7%. Okay. okay. Just so, yeah. All right. Then that's good. I was just curious of your feedback on that one. Perfect. Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So seller has an option, which is E, of retaining all sums paid by the buyer, including deposit money, should a buyer fail to make an additional payment as specified in paragraph two, or furnish false or incomplete information to the seller, broker, or any other party identified in the agreement concerning buyer's legal or financial status. So that would fall under paragraph eight for mortgage, right? They lied to Wells Fargo. And you have Wells Fargo as identified in paragraph eight. So they're part of this agreement. Or violation or fail to perform or fulfill and perform any terms of the contract. So at any point of the contract, if there is a violation or failure to perform by the buyer is a default, unless otherwise checked in paragraph 26G, seller may elect to retain those sums paid by the buyer, including deposit monies on account of purchase price, or as monies to be applied to seller's damages or as liquidated damages for such a default. So line 719 must be checked off. That says seller is limited to retaining sums paid by the buyer, including deposit monies as liquid damages. If seller retains all sums paid by the buyer, including deposit monies as liquid damages pursuant to paragraph 26 F or G, buyer and seller are released from further liabilities or obligations and this agreement is void. Broker and licensees are not responsible for unpaid deposits. It's not our fault. If that buyer says, no way, I'm getting the hell out of here, I'm not making that. You've gone over in detail and explained to them that they are still obligated, even though they want the hell out to make that second deposit you are not responsible for them not making that payment. Mediation. Buyer and seller will submit all disputes or claims that arise from this agreement, including disputes or claims over deposit monies to mediation. Mediation will be conducted in accordance with the rules and procedures of the home seller, home buyer's dispute resolution systems, unless it's not available in which case buyer and seller will mediate according to the terms of the mediation system offered or endorsed by the local association of realtors. That last part of the sentence deals with a very rural part of the state of Pennsylvania where they don't have a mediation.
education platform already set up. So Suburban West, Montgomery, which is now part of Suburban, now it's Tri-County or Dual County, whatever. GPAR, we, we have all boards that we belong to because we're in an urban setting here. Okay, so that part of local association of realtors is only going to happen in very rural areas. We have boards that have set precedents on how we handle this. Containing uh, um, will be divided equal. So then it says, uh, mediation fees contained in the mediation fee schedule will be divided equal. So let's use GPAR as an example. Whomever files for mediation dispute, dispute resolution in GPAR has a $50 non-refundable fee to file for that. Then the cost to mediate, GPAR uses professional mediators. That cost is divided equally between the parties, between the buyer and the seller. Right now that cost is $500. The buyer pays 250 and the seller will pay 250. Will be divided equally among the parties and will be paid before mediation conference. This mediation process must be concluded before any party to the dispute may legal in, in mm, may oh my god initiate legal proceedings in any courtroom with the exception of filing for a summons if it is necessary to stop the statute of limitation from expiring. Any agreement reached through mediation and signed by the parties will be binding. Any agreement to mediate dispute or claims arising from this agreement will survive settlement. Will go on post-settlement. You could still dispute. That's we spoke about that earlier. This is a very complicated two paragraphs. Paragraph 26 and 27 are extremely complicated. Release, buyer releases, quick claim and forever discharges, seller, our brokers, their licensees, employees, and any officer or partner, partner of any one of of them and any other person, firm, or corpor corporation who may be liable by or through them from any and all claims, losses, and demands included but not limited to personal injury and property damage and any consequences thereof, whether known or not, which may arise from the presence of termites or other wood boring insects, radon, lead-based paint hazards, mold, fungi, indoor air quality, environmental hazards, any defects in the individual on-lot sewage disposal systems or deficiencies on site water service systems or any defects or conditions of the property. Should seller be in default under the terms of this agreement, or in violation of any seller disclosure laws or regulations, this release does not deprive the buyer of any right to pursue any remedies that may be available under the law or its equal. This release will survive settlement. Real estate recovery funds. A real estate recovery fund exists to reimburse any per person who have obtained a final civil judgment against a Pennsylvania real estate licensee or a licensee's affiliates, owning to fraud, misrepresentation, or deceit in a real estate transaction, or have been unable to collect the judgment after exhausting all legal and equitable remedies. For complete details about the fund, there's a phone number. What paragraph 29 is saying is, Vicki Carey was found guilty of fraud and misrepresentation in a transaction. She took the $1,000 good faith check and instead of giving it to the listing agent, 
She takes that check and goes to the sugar house. She has a friend who cashes the check. Vicki takes the thousand dollars, puts it on black and red comes out. She loses the thousand dollars. She is found to be fraud and mis misrepresentation according to the state of Pennsylvania. Now that buyer is looking for that thousand dollars because Vicki put it on black and red came out. She's not allowed to do that. Vicki only lives in the box that her BMW came in. We've tried all kinds of ways to get that thousand dollars. She doesn't have it. At that point, the buyer then can go to the real estate recovery fund to obtain that thousand dollars that was lost because Vicki is a, a bad realtor. Okay. I just want to know. I yeah. just want to know. I live for your side comments, Vicki. <laughs> Did I live in the B the box my BMW came in? That, that one or the sugar house that, that <laughs> made my afternoon. I, I live for your side comments. So thank you. This is, this is, this is very uh, enhancing to, to, to what is not a very uh, exciting uh, document. It's not exciting, but it kind of makes sense because we know what the sugar house is and we know about the boxes the BMWs come in, right? You're always on point. Okay, there we go. Communication with with buyer and seller. Now, actually this paragraph is pretty important and here's why. If buyer is obtaining mortgage financing, buyer shall promptly deliver to broker for the buyer of any, a copy of all loan estimates and closing documents upon receipt. So that means that you need an estimate of closing costs as the buyer's agent from the loan institution. Stay the hell away from Bright's estimate of closing. The only time you need to use that is in a cash transaction. Wherever is agreement containing the provision that requires or allows communication slash delivery to a buyer, that provision shall be satisfied by communication and delivery to the broker for the buyer, if any, except for documents required to be delivered pursuant to paragraph 16. If there is no broker for the buyer, those provisions may be satisfied only by communication and delivery being made directly to the buyer, unless otherwise agreed to the party. Wherever this agreement contains a provision that requires or allows communication delivery to a seller, that provision shall be satisfied by communication and delivery to the broker for the seller. If any, if there is no broker to the seller, those provisions may be satisfied only by communication and delivery being made directly to the seller. So that would be as a FISBO. So a FISBO does get notified of the mortgage commitment. And as indicated, the mortgage commitment date, that seller has to be notified of those terms. If there's no broker, it says again, those provisions may be satisfied only by communication and delivery directly to the seller unless otherwise agreed to by the parties. So everybody has to have communication. Heading, the section and paragraph heading of these agreements are for convenience only and are not included to indicate all of the matter in the section, which follows them. They shall have no effect whatsoever to determine the right, obligation, and intent of the parties. That paragraph is saying we've taken and given some headings to all of these paragraphs, but note the answer to your question may actually be found in another paragraph. Okay, sometimes they intertwine with each other. We move on. Paragraph 32, page 14, special clauses. Now, something very interesting here. These following are attached to be made part of the agreement of sale if checked. The first four are all terms for a special clause for sale and settlement of another property. There are four different forms 
that might be used if the sale and settlement of another property is indicated. So you say, well, which one am I using? Well, I don't know. What is your circumstances? You have to look up all four of these and determine which of these four apply to my needs as a buyer. Okay, so it's really important. If you have to sell another property so that those proceeds move on, which we do what, 97% of the time? Then one of these have to go along with that. You actually need this in any kind of standard agreement of sale when the buyer for 123 Main Street is sending the proceeds from 678 Pine Street that's up for sale needs to happen. It's a daisy chain. Pine Street's got to sell. So the buyer takes those proceeds so that they can buy Main Street. One of these addendums needs to apply because guess what? If you don't add one of these and Pine Street doesn't close, you can't buy Main Street, which puts you in a default because you didn't protect your buyer's dupa backside. You didn't do it. You didn't add that. What if something freaky, freaky happens? Like the house catched on fire, even though that's part of this. And the buyer's like, wait a minute. I don't give a hoot what the insurance company is going to give. I have an option to get out of this and I'm getting out. That thing burnt like hell. Oh no, I don't want to be part of this. Oh, well, you didn't have a clause that says, regardless of the circumstances, Pine Street's got to sell so I can buy Main Street. Then that buyer is still responsible to find, buy Main Street. But now they're in default because they didn't have a way out if Pine Street didn't close. Woo, that's a hot can of worms, isn't it? Be very, very careful. You have to protect your buyer because that seller of Pine Street that you were the agent for now has to protect the buyer for Main Street. If something should go awry for Pine Street, that buyer needs protection. Otherwise they are still obligated to buy Main Street, but they can't because the proceeds from Pine Street's not happening. Be careful, careful, careful. MetLife Insurance Company, used to do a commercial with Snoopy. And Snoopy would be dancing with his head up. Da, 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 da. And it, the commercial used to say, the what if in life, if you start living by the what if in life, if you stop for a minute and think, everybody's too much in a hurry, stop, think, what could possibly go wrong here? And you review the worst case scenarios. The question is, can my client, buyer or seller, live with the worst case scenario? If they can't, you better figure out how you're going to protect them. The what ifs in life, review. What is the worst thing that can possibly happen in this transaction? And can my client live with that? So the first four boxes have to deal with sale and settlement of another property contingency. You got to read them and decide which one of them works for you. Appraisal contingency. What type of mortgage is an appraisal contingency addendum not needed? All of them. Nope. Now remember, this is a separate piece of paper. From paragraph 32, this is a special addendum, appraisal contingency. In the agreement of sale, there is that rectangular box on page four. Excuse me, page three. Nope, page four, I was right. On the bottom, FHABA. That paragraph on page four is your mortgage contingency, but only for FHA VA. So if you are a conventional mortgage, you're gonna to need to add an appraisal contingency if need be. Short sale addendum. 
you know that this is a short sale. It's indicated in um, the MLS. You need to add a short sale addendum contingency. And then there's other additional terms that might be needed. Other conditions to hold this contract together. Other issues that have to be addressed to keep this together. That's when you add those, okay? Buyer and seller acknowledges the receipt of a copy of this agreement at the time of signing. If you are having this wet signed, who could tell me what the term wet sign means? Physically signing with a pen. With a pen. <laughs> Don't be cheap. Run off a copy of an agreement of sale and give it to your sellers at that time. Okay, because okay. you don't have a Xerox machine or a copy machine in your trunk of your car. So just bring an extra one so they have a copy of what they signed, okay? This agreement may be executed in one or more counterparts, each of which shall be deemed to be an original and which counterparts together shall constitute one of the same agreements of the parties. What the hell does that mean? The sellers, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, will sell the, sign this agreement of sale. Mr. Jones is on the other side of the earth. He's in China. He will sign it electronically. Mrs. Jones, who's been a stay-at-home mom for years, is going to wet sign it because you drove over there and talk to both of them via Zoom or whatever and she wet signs it and he 15 hours later, because he's on the other side of the earth, is signing it electronically. Even though it was signed two different ways, electronically and wet signed, at two different times, in two different ways, come together and make an executed contract, okay? Notice of the parties, when signed, this agreement is a binding contract. Parties to this transaction are advised to consult a Pennsylvania real estate attorney. Notice who they specify, a real estate attorney, before signing if they desire legal advice. When you have either a buyer or a seller indicating they want to have the contract reviewed by an attorney, please indicate to them, it really needs to be a real estate attorney. I use this analogy that has worked like a charm and I'm gonna share it with you. There are those buyers or sellers who will question the necessity of having a real estate attorney. Why can't just any attorney be good enough? And I've used this scenario that's worked really well. And I'll comment and tell the seller or buyer, I'm using this as an analogy. Mr. Seller, I noticed some clouding in your eyes. Clearly you have a cataract. If you choose to have that cataract removed, Mr. Seller, will you be using your wife's gynecologist? And you get a snicker every single time. And they go, well, no, I'm not gonna use a gynecologist to take out a cataract. My response is, well, why not? They're both doctors, aren't they? And that seems to be the aha moment. I have found if you can correlate a situation to medicine, Joe Public, for some reason, gets a better grasp of it. And when I say, but why not? Is not the gynecologist a physician? And is not the ophthalmologist a physician? the cataract surgeon, so what's the difference? Oh, well, you seem to feel there's a big difference, Mr. Seller. That is my point. You want good attorney review? Then go to whom practices real estate law. Let's do it right from the beginning. You will find it'll work really well. Returning of this agreement and any addendum or addenda included returning by electronic transmission 
bearing the signature of all parties constitutes the acceptance of the parties. The buyers need to initial off that they have received the consumer notice. They have received a statement of buyer's estimate of closing before signing the agreement. They have received the deposit money notice to whom is holding the deposit monies, either the brokerage who represents a seller or another entity, an attorney, a title company. Buyers receive the lead-based paint hazard disclosure, which is attached to this agreement of sale. Buyer has received the pamphlet, protect your family from lead in the home. Buyer now signs either electronically or wet signs. Seller has received the consumer notice, they will sign off. Seller has received a statement of seller's estimate of closing costs before signing the agreement. If you ever have to do at the table, you're at the table and you wanna do an um, an addendum at the table. If these words are not added to the addendum, the addendum is worthless. The addendum to the agreement of sale will die the day after the date indicated on the agreement of sale or any extensions thereof. If you are to settle on December the 17th and you have a dispute and you fill out an addendum and everybody signs it. On December the 18th, that addendum is null and void because that addendum was attached to the agreement of sale and the agreement of sale died on the 17th. At 12.01 on the 18th, that addendum is worthless unless you add this verbiage. This agreement of terms will survive settlement. That must be added to the addendum at the table you guys are filling out. That statement, this agreement of terms will survive settlement, means it will go beyond the settlement date. Now that's not written in the agreement, that's a little, little tidbit of FYI I'm feeding you. You must always add that verbiage. This agreement of terms will survive settlement. If you ever have to add an addendum at the table, such as um, it's a rehab and there is a cabinet that is missing in the kitchen because they couldn't get, it was a special order size. And the buyer says, I'll buy the property. Just bring me the cabinet when you get it from the manufacturer. Six months later, we still don't have it. Well, who are you going to fight with? Because you never said that that addendum was going to survive settlement. It died with the date after the closing was supposed to happen. Be real careful. Those addendums agents get done all the time and they're so proud of them and say to their buyer, look at that. See how I saved you? See how I came up with this really good addendum? Means nothing. That addendum died with the agreement because the agreement of sale has an expiration date. So be very careful. You want it to go beyond the execution date. This agreement of terms will survive settlement. There you go, guys. Now you're fabulous. Any questions? All right, listen. Every day, each of us learns something about this business. This business is very complex. Do not take it upon yourself when there is a question or a doubt in your mind, am I doing this right? Pick up the phone and call somebody. Those of you on a team, you need to call your team leader first. I am not the first phone call. Those of you who are independent agents, if you're not on a team and you are not in coaching or mentoring, 
You call them first, then I'm the phone call. Okay. But you got to call somebody because not for nothing. You guys aren't that fabulous. I know you're quite sure you are. And that's great. You feel that confident, but I'm telling you, you're not that good. And sometimes even really, really good agents need to talk it out. Need to say, am I thinking right here? Does this make sense to you? Years ago, and I would do it tomorrow if I felt the need. If I ever had to write an addendum and I was like, am I hitting all the high points here? I used to give it to a, a coworker, another agent who knows nothing about the transaction. And I'd hand over that addendum and I'd say, do me a favor, read that over and tell me what you think. And if they read it over and they're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Good job, Vic. Yay. But what if they said to me, Vic, I don't understand. Why did this happen? And why are you doing that? Then I knew I didn't create it right. I knew all the answers weren't answered in that addendum or verified. So it's well worth to have someone review your work and say, what do you think? Does this make sense to you? They may come up with a sentence or a paragraph that you're like, ah, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Thank you. Now that ties it together. You know, talking it out, talking out loud, bouncing it off of another agent. It, it really helps. It really does. Okay. So have a wonderful holiday, guys. Whatever you celebrate, I hope you're having fun with it. Okay. Even though this is crazy crap going on. <laughs> I heard. Thank you, Vicky. You're welcome. I just got some fabulous news last night. The best thing for 2020. I have a a niece who's an attorney, and she just got accepted to a large law firm, and I was so happy for her. I said, finally, something good out of 2020. Which I got to tell you is not been a lot. That that ratio of good news, bad news. But that was a good one. So hopefully for the last couple of days for you guys, you're going to have some good news too. Okay. Congratulations. All right, guys. Thank See you. you. Bye. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.